So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the Buru Barongal people of the Durag Nation, upon whose ancestral lands we now stand. Uh, we would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for these lands, and of course, as the first storytellers of our land. Um, I'd like to welcome Melissa Lukashenko, PEN members, writers and all others who've joined us here today to mark the 37th International Day of the Imprisoned Writer. I'm Zoe Rodriguez, I'm PEN Sydney's Vice President and I'm the Chair of PEN International Search Committee. I would like to acknowledge Copyright Agency's Cultural Fund support that makes this lecture possible. Uh, with cultural funding, we are able to commission Melissa to spend the time to write a thoughtful lecture for us, give us the transcript to publish in our magazine, and to fly her down from Brisbane to give this lecture. So many thanks to Copyright Agency's Cultural Fund, which is money that comes from Australia's authors, artists and publishers, and goes back into supporting wonderful things like this. The order for today. Melissa will deliver the Penn Sydney Free Voices lecture uh, on this day of the imprisoned writer. There will be 15 minutes for question and answer. Then afterwards, a less formal part of the proceedings, uh, we will go upstairs, or is it downstairs? I'm so uh, badly located in this building, to the cafe area, and there will be tables and chairs. And for those of you who would like, we do card signing on this night. So it's about imprisoned writers. We write cards to writers who are imprisoned in our region. We have selected five writers from Turkey, from Syria, from China, from Vietnam, and, of course, Beirut Bushani, who is effectively imprisoned under Australian law. Um, so Penn was founded in 1921 in England. Uh, the Australian chapter opened in Sydney in 1931. The Melbourne section opened up five years later and what we are is a non-political organisation which holds special consultative status at the United Nations and associate status at UNESCO. It's the world's oldest human rights organisation and the oldest international literary organisation with around 150 centres in over 100 countries and the NGO um, Structure was one dreamt up by writers. They are creators in every sense. Penn's goals. We aim to emphasise the role of literature in the development of mutual understanding and world culture, to fight for freedom of expression and to act as a powerful voice on behalf of writers harassed, imprisoned and sometimes killed for their views. The empty chair, which we have here today, symbolises the writer who cannot be with us today due to imprisonment. Sadly, there are many, many authors we could have chosen for this dubious entitlement. Today, our empty chair is dedicated to Beirut Bushani. And for those of you who don't know who Beirut Bushani is, he is the Kurdish-Iranian writer, journalist, blogger, poet, uh, who remains on Manus Island, marooned, effectively imprisoned, and Penn Sydney and Penn International will advocate for his release until it occurs, and we want him accepted in Australia as an asylum seeker or taken to a third country where he will be safe. Uh, now, Melissa Lukashenko will deliver the Penn lecture. Um, this is our way of standing in solidarity with the many writers across our region and the world who are persecuted, imprisoned or assassinated for their writing. Melissa is a widely acclaimed Aboriginal author of Guri and European heritage. She's acknowledged for her literary skills as a novelist, essayist and short story writer. Among a growing list of prizes, she's won a Victorian Premier's Literary Award and a Walkley Award for long-form journalism. When I was manager of Copyright Agency's <coughs> Cultural Fund, under Brian Johns, we established the Authors' Fellowship. This was to celebrate 40 years of Cal, 
and Brian's idea was we needed to give writers money so that they had time to write. He understood very well that that was the number one need of most of our authors. And I was very pleased when she won the fellowship, which was $80,000. Not as pleased as I was. <laughs> I'll tell you about that. <laughs> to complete the manuscript of her recently published Too Much Lip. Uh, and I was delighted to be in that assessment meeting where the three assessors, who were Craig Munro, the publisher, um, Sue Martin, who was the head of ASIL at the time, and Mabel Lee, the gifted and very honoured translator of works from Chinese, were judging. And after they'd made their decision, and it was hard, there were some very good works there, uh, I was glad with the choice they'd made. I happened to agree, though I'd kept my trap shut. Um, and I said, would you like to make a call? And they said, what do you mean? I said, I think this is going to be a very happy call. <laughs> and we phoned Melissa from Cal's boardroom, and I said, I think this is a call you're going to like. And there were whoops. <laughs> so that was great. Um, and I'm told that perhaps... Melissa avoided Uber driving as a result of that win. I did. <laughs> I am an avid fan of Melissa's fiction and non-fiction. She compels her readers to consider their role in life and to reflect on their relationships with other humans, animals and landscape. Her writing informs of the racism and maltreatment of Indigenous Australians, done deftly but unequivocally and also done with humour. Melissa... Can I invite you to deliver the Penn Sydney Free Voices 2018 International Day of the Imprisoned Writer Lecture? You may. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. And like Zoe, um, I too would like to acknowledge that I am Jeranga Leila on Gadigal land and uh, thank the Gadigal people for their gracious hosting of me here. It's a bit ironic that I'm here uh, in Sydney actually talking about or well, giving the lecture um, about the imprisoned writer uh, because I've just flown down from a conference uh, run by an organisation I've been involved with for 25 years now, Sisters Inside. So I've, I've left a, uh, a conference absolutely chock full of um, former prisoners and people working in prison reform <laughs> to come here and talk to you about um, freedom, really. And the title of my talk, oh, before I begin, um, the speech I've written contains anti-Semitic and racist images and ideas that I'll be talking about. So um, if you're particularly affected by anti-Semitism or racism, um, just be aware of that. So um, I'm not going to talk about imprisoned people, and I'm not going to talk very much about imprisoned writers, although I will touch on Baruz Bashani. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about when freedom kills. So I'm not a huge fan of keynotes. Um, I get invited to do a keynote about once a fortnight, as in I get an email once a fortnight. And uh, sometimes when they come in, it's enough to make you lose the world to live. I've got a bit of paper in front of my study where I live in Mullumbimby and it's got two things written on it. The first one is no more travel in capital letters and the second one in, also in capital letters is no more keynotes. So instead of delivering a keynote, I'm just going to tell you a few brief stories about freedom and free speech and about the experience of being black or otherwise marginal in Western liberal democracies in 2018. And hopefully these few stories will cohere into a keynote as we go along. Let's see. And I'll preface the stories by saying that I finished writing this piece last Sunday, which was Armistice Day. Well, Poppy Day is a much prettier name, I think. And so I had in the back of my mind as I wrote this the wartime experiences of my brother, who's a Vietnam vet, recovering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and my uncle, who was a veteran of the Pacific War. And I was also thinking a lot about an Aboriginal ex-serviceman who was murdered in Brisbane last year in a racist attack. And all Aboriginal men like these have historically been denied the right to speak freely 
by the Queensland Government. But more than that, they and most of the Aboriginal community have been denied the right to hear and speak our Aboriginal languages. Because as blackfellas in Queensland, our ancestors were reprimanded and beaten and exiled to missions if we spoke our languages. There's stories of elders in the laundry at Sherberg Mission whispering their language under their breath to kids in secret so that words and language would not be forgotten. And when we protested this sort of treatment, nobody listened. So free speech is not always an idea that has been meaningful for Aboriginal people, which is kind of the topic of my talk. So the first story that I'll tell you is called Being Very Careful Around White People. Okay? All visible people of colour in the West, mostly people whose skin is darker than a brown paper bag, which, if you don't know, is an old racist test in the USA, the test of acceptable skin tone. All visible people of colour have stories about being careful around white people, usually lots of stories. And depending on which Western liberal democracy we live in or what particular ethnicity we are, our level of caution falls somewhere on a spectrum from vague concern down one end up to constant hypervigilance at the other. And I, I remembered actually writing this paper, a story that Auntie Jackie Huggins told me years ago, that there was an Aboriginal man in Brisbane who was hospitalised with schizophrenia in the 1970s after a lifetime of racist abuse. And this bloke, he tipped over, as many of us do, from vigilance into outright paranoia and began talking to his doctor about the government persecuting him and coming to get him and coming for his kids and so on and so forth. Except it turned out after he'd spent years in the nut house that he hadn't tipped at all. This black man lost years of his life after being misdiagnosed by a white professional who didn't know enough and didn't care enough about the circumstances of his Aboriginal patient's life to realise that he was sane. The man spoke, but he wasn't heard, and that's a common experience for our mob. So that's an Australian version of being very careful around white people, or of not being careful enough. But the actual story comes from the USA, and it's a story you probably already know. So on the 22nd of July 2009, Barack Obama had been president for nine months. And on that day, police in Cambridge, Massachusetts, arrested a black man attempting to break into a house in broad daylight. <coughs> you familiar with this? Yeah. Hmm. Arrested for what, the black man asked angrily, for being black in America? And unfortunately for the cop involved, it eventually became clear that he'd arrested Emeritus Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr., one of the most highly respected scholars of African-American history alive today. And Professor Gates, who is the founder of the website Roots.com, was breaking into his own home in an upmarket suburb. Ed Pilkington in The Guardian put it, prolific writer, television presenter, director of Harvard's W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African-American Research, mate of Oprah Winfrey, Gates's connections and accomplishments go on and on. But when he returned from a trip to China, well, he was just another black man engaging in nefarious activities. When I heard about this, I was instantly reminded of Marsha Langton, who wrote in the 90s of returning to Australia from overseas and thinking at the airport, oh God, I'm just a bung again. So... Professor Gates spent four hours seething in the watch house, no doubt composing many pointed editorials as he sat. And when he was allowed out on bail, fellow Harvard academics were at hand to drive him home. The incident blew up in the media, of course. The mayor of Cambridge rang Gates to apologise, as well she might. President Obama was required to do something about this transparent racism, and yet for fear of white voter backlash, he couldn't condemn it outright. 
you did describe the arrest as stupid, given that Gates was in his own home and had shown ID to the cop to prove it. And Obama did draw parallels to police harassment of black and Latino Americans over many years. Don't know about the Native Americans, where they came into it. Professor Gates threatened a lawsuit if the officer didn't apologise for lying about what happened in the incident and the officer refused. And the cop referred to, quote, being surprised at how Gates had reacted and behaved, unquote, upon being asked to prove ownership of his own home while standing in it. Tensions increased. One third of white voters blamed Gates for his arrest in his own home. A dangerous impasse had been arrived at, and so to cool tensions, Obama invited Gates and the officer to discuss it over a beer at the White House. The offer was accepted and beer was drunk. Professor Gates said afterwards that the officer was a likeable guy when he wasn't arresting you. <laughs> and although this incident made it abundantly clear to people of colour that Professor Gates was not in fact free to verbally protest his arrest after showing proof of ownership, the crisis nevertheless seemed to have been averted. The incident cost Obama six percentage points in popularity with white voters and is seen as the beginning of a long decline in his standing with that group. We all now know where that decline in standing has led us. So what's the moral of this little story? The moral of this first story is that for people of colour, even when you are an emeritus professor at Harvard and even when you are president of the USA, you can't necessarily speak freely and you especially can't speak freely about race. And as always, it's wise to be very careful around white people and that goes double for white police with guns pointed at you in your own suburban home. The second story is called What We Talk About When We Talk About Manas. In September 2001, the Twin Towers fell, and ever since, terror has been the headline in the West. For Aboriginal people, terror arrived in 1788. Lachlan Macquarie ordered the beheading of Aboriginal people in order to, and I quote, strike terror into the hearts of the natives, unquote in New South Wales, and he ordered it not very far from where, where we are tonight. But if we focus on the best publicised terrors of this century, the Twin Towers and the Wars of Revenge, which have followed September 11, we quickly observed the flight of citizens from the affected countries. And we've had the scourge of the Tampa incident and we're still mired in the deep shame of deliberate cruelty to <coughs> refugees as policy. It's no accident that many of the Syrian and Iranian and other refugees who fled to Australian shores are now imprisoned in a distant place under the technical jurisdiction of another government because a significant number of people in Australia care. Even when our governments seek to lie and cover up the truth, enough of us care to not give in, to not stop talking about the abuses of innocent fellow humans under our watch. Baruz Bachani has written No Friend But the Mountains about the five years he's been in jail for the crime of being a refugee. The book, as I'm sure you all know, was written one text at a time on a mobile phone, since any paper copy of his novel would have been destroyed by guards, which our taxpayers' taxes are paying for. Baruz Bashani is not free to leave Manus Island. Effectively, he is not free to speak or to write. Nor are workers in these places. Bashani has written about one camp worker who resigned to become an activist and said of this woman, when she witnessed instances of suicide and self-harm, she would immediately go to the Salvation Army office to notify them. During those times, they were warned about talking to the media. They were told not to talk to any journalist or media organisation about the situation in Manus prison camp. He quotes her saying, I remembered the warning we received about speaking out. 
and what would happen to staff if we did. The strongest memory I had, this is the worker speaking, was a feeling of desperation, helplessness to do something about what I had seen. I had the hopeless realisation that there was nothing I could do to help. Because for all their championing of so-called free speech, erasure of the story is what our federal government actually wants. Our government has actively attacked NGOs who speak out. Our government has tried desperately to kill the information flow which underpins Australian goodwill towards refugees. Our government has tried to paint these refugees as undeserving of care or ordinary human empathy. As an Aboriginal person, I know well what it feels like to be on the end of such dehumanising government propaganda. And this means that what we talk about when we talk about Manus is often very little of substance. One public servant, Michaela Banerjee, talked about Manus, and our government sacked her for it. Banerjee took the federal government to court and she won compensation for unfair dismissal. The appeals tribunal overturned a decision by the Commonwealth insurer to deny her workers' compensation. And during the tri tribunal's deliberations, it said that APS employees have the same right to freedom of expression as other members of the community, subject to legitimate public interests. But the tribunal went further. It went on to liken the Commonwealth Government's efforts to restrict anonymous comments on Facebook from public servants as resembling George Orwell's thought crime. And you might think, when you reflect on Banerjee's story, that, great, the democratic safeguards triumphed. The rule of law protected her free speech. But it took her five years to get a result. That is, for five years, the same government which bleats piously to us about free speech when it comes to the far right attacking Aborigines or Muslims or immigrants or LGBTI people about the right to be bigots. The same government fought this Australian woman trying to exert her right to free speech in her Canberra home. And the government hasn't changed its spots, despite sustained pressure from the Australian government. Even as the refugee policy is increasingly on the nose, Green Senator Nick McKim was refused entry to Nauru just a few short weeks ago after advice from DFAT. So that's what we talk about when we talk about Manus, not celebrating human rights, not the welcoming of new citizens to build new futures here, safe from the wars we played a part in creating, but the torture of children and the gross hypocrisy of those in power for whom free speech is an empty platitude to be trotted out when expedient and ignored when it is not. This is Anthony Borges. Anthony's a 15-year-old. At the time um, the picture was taken was a 15-year-old Venezuelan immigrant to the US. Anthony was in, um, present in the Parkland school massacre. And the scars on his body and the colostomy bag he's wearing are because Anthony saved the lives of 20 of his schoolmates by barricading a door that the gunman was shooting through and he stopped the bullets with his own body and saved 20 lives. Anthony Borges is a Latin American immigrant to the United States. And the third story, the final story I want to tell you tonight, is called Mexicans. When Donald Trump was elected, I thought, here we go again. I grew up in Queensland under Joe Bjorki Peterson, and a police state is still quite normal to me in fundamental ways, especially as a black fella for whom not enough has changed. I thought, though, that Trump might be gone within the year. How wrong I was. I also thought that the history of the USA being a refuge for immigrants and the inclusion of many Jewish people in the major institutions of the US would mean that the Jewish community would be relatively insulated from the rise of the far right. 
I was stunned to see anti-Semitic brackets appearing around the names of public Jewish figures in print. I was equally astounded at Trump's behaviour on Holocaust Day last year when he literally didn't mention the Shoah or Jews. And now in 2018, we can read headlines in the Washington Post saying, Trump's America is not a safe place for Jews. Before this current era of Trump-inspired massacres in synagogues and black churches, though, Trump and his crew of far-right bullies had turned first to easier targets, the Mexicans, the Muslims and the undocumented migrants, immigrants. The first target of Trumpian policy in government was legal immigration from majority Muslim nations. A colleague of mine was caught up in this racial attack, stranded at an American airport with no idea what was happening. An educated and articulate woman my own age, she must have found it terrifying and bewildering. Like most observers, I was deeply angered at the speed with which the old civil order shifted in the US. Free speech has long been used as weasel words by the right to undermine democracy and human rights, but Trump fast took it to a whole other level. And let's, let's not forget that Trump, that warrior of free speech, that crusader against so-called political correctness, has written in his autobiography of giving his grade two music teacher a black eye. Just let that sink in a moment. He characterised that incident in the book not as some kind of childhood pathology or psychopathy, but rather as, quote, a tendency to stand up and make my opinions known in a forceful way. Black eye. Trump's exhortations to his base since being nominated by the Republican Party have included the following statements. Iowa. If you see someone getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. OK, just knock the hell. I promise you I will pay for the legal fees. Nevada. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. It's true. I'd like to punch him in the face, I tell you. North Carolina. We had some people, some rough guys, and they started punching back. It was a beautiful thing. In the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. And when they protested once, you know, they would not do it again so easily, but today they walk in and they get away with murder because we've become weak. Virginia. Get him out of here, please. Get him out. Get him out. Are you from Mexico? Are you from Mexico? Huh? Are you from Mexico? Missouri. Part of the problem and part of the reason it takes so long is no one wants to hurt each other anymore, right? And they're being politically correct in the way they take them out, so it takes a little bit longer. And honestly, protesters, they realise that there are no consequences to protesting anymore. There used to be consequences. So let's reflect on that. The problem in Trump's America is that there are no consequences for protesters. And nobody wants to hurt anybody anymore. That's a problem too, apparently. Trump had, of course, targeted Mexicans and Latinos very early in his campaign, painting them as rapists and criminals. Free speech. Political correctness. I knew by the time Lionel Shriver came to Brisbane and mocked the humanity of Mexican-Americans there that her words were not free speech in any meaningful sense of the word. They were rather part of a deliberate shoring up and strengthening of white supremacist discourse. Shriver is very much part of a movement which sees the right of white people to continue to dominate the public discourse as natural and inalienable and threatened when protested by people of colour. The world before Trump was changing for the better in some ways, and Shriver, a Republican, didn't like it. 
I thought about the best way to counter her white supremacist speech. At one point, I considered confronting her with a spear in my hand in the green room. <laughs> I imagine that most of you in this room find that idea shocking, because I was seriously thinking about it. And I would say in response that the naive Tay of white Australians is shocking. You, their belief that the language of so-called free speech, weaponised as a tool of white supremacy, that, that, a belief that this doesn't kill actual Aboriginal people and other minorities on a regular basis, is what shocks me and my community again and again and again. We have the world's highest recorded suicide rates. And those suicide rates arise in part from our exposure to the toxic racism of mainstream Australia, which is fed by and delights in the abuse of so-called free speech to harass, belittle and torment us. Elijah Doherty was run down and murdered by a white man in Kalgoorlie who took time off work to hunt him. White supremacy is real. Racism and hate speech have consequences, sometimes mortal consequences, and that's why I took it up to Shriver. I'll do it again in a heartbeat. The thing about the chimera... Is that how you say it? Chimera? Chimera. Chimera of free speech, as it is currently misused, is that it isn't free at all. It costs us dearly. When Andrew Bolt distorts or simply ignores facts in his attacks on Aboriginal people, or when the Australian government lies about how many and what sort of refugees are locked up offshore, what kind of freedom is being protected? I see the results every week in my community. The trauma visited upon those subject to hate speech is real. The last thing that governments and the right want is free speech, from Beijing to Istanbul to Canberra, to Washington. I've struggled with free speech because the two ideas about free speech that I had in my mind until recently were famous quotes. Voltaire's, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And what the slave owner Jefferson said, that the freedom of the press cannot be limited without being lost. My difficulty was the contrast between the state abuses, which genuine free speech definitely protects us from, and the serious ongoing damage which hate speech does to my people. Imagine my surprise when I learned that free speech is not synonymous with a free-for-all, that hate speech is not, in fact, free speech. Genuine freedom of expression is an antidote to tyranny. We all know this. That's why governments and state actors all over the globe try and stop it. That's why Jamal Khashoggi is dead, hacked to pieces inside a Saudi consulate. That's why Aboriginal people here were beaten and jailed for speaking our own languages until several short decades ago. And that's why multi-billionaires like Murdoch and his ilk take very good care to control what media we have access to, to the degree that they can do that. But researching this talk, I found that contrary to the rhetoric and those quotes that I mentioned, free speech was never meant to be unlimited nor allowed to descend into vicious propaganda. Researching this speech, I was reminded that Locke and Rousseau both argued that we gain our civil rights in return for accepting the obligation to respect and defend the rights of others. And I read Article 11 of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. The free communication of ideas and opinions is one of the most precious of the rights of man. Every citizen may accordingly speak, write and print with freedom, but shall be responsible for such abuses of this freedom as shall be defined by law. What does defined by law mean in 2018? Well... We find in too many instances that the idea of freedom of speech is subject to gross manipulation. It's abused by those with the money to distort it and weaponise it in the interests of a far-right agenda. Yale professor Jim Sleeper has argued that pseudo-free speech, which he calls hollow speech, 
and hostile speech is an act of civic mindlessness removed from all social responsibility and hollow speech is prosecuted by exactly those with an interest in denying genuine free speech to citizens. He talks about the use of um, big money to create platforms which go on to pretend that they speak as individual actors. Breitbart News is exactly one such platform. And he also talks about how Canada legislates free speech differently and better than the US. Which brings me to the disturbing and somewhat baffling ignorance about the connection between hollow speech and white supremacy. When Steve Bannon came to Australia recently, he was fated by our media, including the ABC. Yet, according to Michael Wolfe in Fire and Fury, the airport chaos in January last year, the legitimate terror and bewilderment of my Muslim friend and many thousands of other passengers, was wholly deliberate. The ban had been crafted by a small policy team of policy hardliners within the Trump administration, primarily Bannon, and it caught the bureaucrats by surprise. And when asked by White House staff why the ban had been implemented so haphazardly and on a busy Friday when airports would be congested and why hadn't they seen this coming, Bannon reportedly said to Wolf that that was the point. They did it that way. They targeted travellers, quote, so the snowflakes would show up at the airport and riot. End quote. Bannon said, according to Wolf. So who exactly are the terrorists again? It would take an astonishing level of naivety to believe that the authoritarians in power, men and women prepared to incite violence at American political rallies and in airports on the basis of race and religion, that these people or their Australian counterparts have any kind of serious commitment to genuine free speech. Yet that is what we are asked to believe again and again and again. I refuse to be played as a patsy in this dangerous game, and I urge you to be similarly sceptical, for sceptical is sadly lacking when it comes to these weasel words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Most of us heard as kids. But try being a 12-year-old Murray boy in Queensland hearing a drip feed of racist abuse day in and day out, despite the best efforts of parents and teachers to control the toxic environment you find yourself in. Try being that child pushed to the brink of suicide by the racist language of white kids, aimed at you as surely as any stick or stone is ever aimed at anyone. Try being one of the thousands of Aboriginal teenagers who will abandon school this year due to racist taunts and leave early, undereducated and often illiterate, and find their ways to juvie and then prison as surely as water flows downhill. Try being a gay or lesbian or Muslim child facing similar abuse. Don't tell me words will never hurt us. So I'm almost out of time, but one last thing. You'll remember that Professor Gates was arrested by a cop in his own home with a gun, and that to be in the presence of a white cop with a gun is a very, very dangerous situation for any person of colour, and in particular for a black man in the US. But cops with guns aren't the only dangers for black American professors in the 21st century. White civilians can be as dangerous. If you hadn't heard of Professor Gates, I imagine most of you have heard of Professor Cornell West, who came to Australia last year on tour. Professor West is another distinguished black academic, at Harvard in his case, and last year, almost eight years exactly after Gates was arrested, Professor Cornell West took part in a counter-protest against torch-wielding neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, 
This event saw American neo-fascists chanting, blood, not soil, and you will not replace us, and Jew will not replace us. This is the mob which Trump described as including some very fine people. No doubt these Nazis with their burning torches believed that as they chanted these vile things that they were exercising their right to free speech. According to an interview on democracynow.com, Professor West had gone to the counter-protest with the intention of getting arrested and drawing attention to the counter-protest. And he also went to see a sermon that his friend was giving, the Reverend Dr Tracy Blackman. And he'd gone along for those two things when he and a handful of others found themselves held hostage inside a church. The progressives were trapped and they were literally outnumbered 10 to 1 by Nazis in 2018. Sorry, 2017. And Professor Cornell told Democracy Now! that the people he was with that night were attacked with swung torches, pepper spray and lighter fluid. He said, you had a number of the courageous students of all colours at the University of Virginia who were protesting against the neo-fascists. The neo-fascists had their own ammunition. And this is very important to keep in mind, he says, because the police, for the most part, pulled back. The next day, for example, those 20 of us who were standing, trapped, many of us clergy, we would have been crushed like cockroaches if it were not for the anarchists and the anti-fascists who approached over 300. We had just 20. And we're singing this little light of mine, which is a Christian hymn, I think. You know, when the anti-fascists and then, crucial, the anarchists, because they <coughs> saved our lives, actually. They saved our lives. When I was putting the finishing touches on this talk the other night, I went for my own interest to Google the name of the young Aboriginal ex-serviceman who was murdered in Brisbane in July. And I Googled these words, Brisbane, murder, knife, Aboriginal, army. And what came up on the screen was not his name, but rather a Wikipedia list a list of massacres of Aboriginal people in Australia beginning in April 1794 at Toongabbie, where an armed party of settlers pursued a group of Aboriginals who were taking corn from the settlers' farms. Party. Settlers. Pursued. It sounds better than a nigger hunt, doesn't it? Better than attempted genocide. I typed in today's murder, and that's what came up. The events of 1794 throw a long shadow in this country. I lied to you earlier. I didn't write this talk at my desk in Mullumbimby because I don't live in Mullumbimby. I don't tell anyone where I live anymore. I lived with a heightened level of caution around white people. Do I live in 1794 in Toon Gabby? No. Is it 1938 in Europe? Is it 2017 in Charlottesville? No, it isn't that either. Are we Mexican? Are we Mexican? Huh? Are we? No. But if we're black or Jewish or LGBTI or Muslim, it can often feel a lot like we are. This image here that you've been looking at for a couple of minutes is not from Charlottesville 20 months ago, and it's not from Warsaw in 1938. This is taken from the Facebook profile of the man who pulled out a knife and stabbed an Aboriginal brother to death in the street in Brisbane in July four months ago. It's the Facebook profile of someone whose online friends ordered me three months ago to stop sharing the swastika image with his name below it and to stop talking about neo-Nazis as a real and present danger in Queensland after my posts were shared hundreds of times. 
These extremists told me that Lee Hillier, the alleged murderer, quote, has a lot of friends and these friends are very loyal to him and I was seriously just asking for trouble. I blocked those people on Facebook immediately and despite my hatred of firearms and gun culture, I walked into a gun shop that week for the first time in three decades. I'm increasingly cautious around white Australians because a small minority of them want to maim me or possibly kill me. And a majority of white Australians are too naive and too closeted by privilege to understand this reality. These are the sort of people who asked when, if not, when asked if Mein Kampf should still be published after the death of six million Jews and God knows how many others reply, it's a grey area. And to conclude, if you ask that minority of far-right fanatics who want to hurt me, or at the very least silence me with terror, they'll tell you that they are true blue patriots, passionate about Australia, and that they love their country and its freedoms. They'll tell you that they despise political correctness. They'll very likely tell you that people like me should be put down like animals. And I'm 100% sure that just like Lionel Shriver and Donald Trump and Steve Bannon and Andrew Bolt and all the other bleating reactionary hypocrites who want the freedom to be openly racist without any negative consequences whatsoever that they are infatuated with, that they simply adore both the principle and the practice of free speech. Thank you. much uh, for an extremely challenging lecture tonight, Melissa. I am going to open to questions and I might repeat them because we're recording and I don't think they'll come up otherwise. Uh, does anybody have a question for Melissa? Uh, I had heard this before, I've well phrased, um, but you had the right to free speech but you should be responsible for the consequences of your speech. Do you have thoughts on who the authority the enforcer should be for that? Okay, so the question was if you have the right to free speech um, and there are... But there are consequences for that There speech. are consequences for that. Who is going to be the arbiter or the authority <laughs> about the limits to free speech? Yeah, well, that's the question, isn't it? Um, all I can say is that institutions must reflect the societies that they're drawn from you know, to the maximum extent possible so that you don't get um, parliament, lily-white parliaments making decisions about policies and laws that, you know, um, disproportionately affect black and brown people. Uh, you've got to have some skin in the game, basically. You know, it's, uh, it's analogous to parliaments full of men making laws about women's reproductive rights. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a... May I follow up? Sure. sure. <clears throat> um, is there, uh, I'm not sure, the act you have in Australia, the Racial Discrimination Act? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, where it originated from in that same context, or do you think it has a, if it had power, <coughs> or could be enacted more? Yeah, of course, it's more about this. Repeat the question, which is, do we have racial discrimination laws in Australia, and could they be used to address some of these problems in Australia, specifically around speech. Specifically around speech. Yeah, I, all I know is that the Racial Discrimination Act came in under the Whitlam administration, I'm pretty sure, in about 75. And what happened in Queensland was that meant that from that time on, from 1975 on, technically Aboriginal people had to be paid the same wages as white people. And I've got friends in the 1980s who've um, were paid less than white people and they've been able to challenge that in court because of the 1975 Act. As far as free speech goes, I don't know. I don't know what the impact of the RDA is. I mean, the, the federal government intervened in the Northern Territory and stripped people of, um, you know, very basic rights by suspending the RDA 
So it's obviously something that can be suspended by Acts of Parliament. And really the, um, the, the battle has to be fought on all kinds of fronts. So yes, in legislation, yes, in parliaments, yes, on the streets. You know, I talked about Professor Cornell West because I wanted to drive home that um, there are actual lives at stake with this kind of behaviour. Um, so I'm sure there is a role for the Racial Discrimination Act and it's important that legislation gets passed and it's also important that people take to the streets when, you know, we've got Brandis saying that people have the right to be bigots. We've got the Parliament passing... Um, motions that it's okay to be white. We, I, you know, it's a slide. In, it's a slow slide into um, times that I didn't think we'd see again. Frankly, Gil. Well, listen. What's your view on the idea of a treaty? Yeah, I think treaty is um, necessary and inevitable. Actually, whether it's one treaty or many treaties, I don't know. We're the only Commonwealth country that doesn't have treaties with Indigenous people. Um, Michael Mansell has suggested a seventh state rather than treaties because he says treaties can be overturned by majority white parliaments and therefore they're a weak mechanism. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not what sure. about the response to the Uluru statement? Are you disappointed by that? <laughs> no, you... I, don't, I don't have enough faith in, in Australian <laughs> governments to get disappointed. Um, and I, I think the Uluru process was, um, it could have been done better. Uh, it could have been done worse. <laughs> yeah, no, I meant the, the lead up to it. Um, it's, it's a very soft option, really, I think. You know, I think, um, was it Mark Liebler was involved with the, um, the organisation of it? And I think he's on the record as saying it. It basically won't, it won't force change, you know. It's, it's an advisory body. What's the point of advising people if they don't listen to you anyway? You know, really, I think there needs to be um, treaty, which is part of the Uluru proposal, but it's, it's kind of wishy-washy and weak to my thinking. And Turnbull knocked it on the head straight away anyway. You know. And again, it's, it's a disconnect between what's happening at community level with Aboriginal people and what happens um, in governments and in those policy fields. There's, there's young Aboriginal people with very little to lose by turning to violence. Very little to lose. You know? They're um, criminalised already, they live in poverty already, their lives are full of suicide and abuse and drugs and poverty, overwhelmingly, poverty, those people must quickly be given some actual political power, you know? Otherwise, um, the kinds of acts of terror that we've been able to stave off so far may not be able to be staved off, you know? There's this big disconnect between people with comfortable lives and people whose lives are really, really grim. Yeah. Susie. Um, Melissa, um, as a great fan of your funny, upfront, brassy way of taking on issues, <laughs> and having, having just read your book very recently, um, I am horrified to hear you talking about the fact that you have felt cowed. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that because that's suggesting you are cowed, but that you've been threatened to the extent that you feel you can't reveal where you live or, um, you know, that you necessarily can't keep writing your blog or your posts or whatever. Mm. I mean, how does that feel to someone like you to, to feel cowed or to be close to feeling cowed to the extent that you go into a gun shop and think of maybe looking for a way to protect yourself. I find that quite shocking and I'm actually surprised that I haven't heard about it in the media or somewhere that that has happened. Uh, again, the disconnect. Um, the levels of racist violence in Australia are shocking. Um, and that's people being physically attacked. That's women who look black, 
in country areas being spat on as they walk down the street and not doing anything about it because they're used to it. Um, for me personally, I don't feel cowed. I, did, um, I had a couple of pretty nervous days because these are the friends of someone who got out a big knife and stabbed someone to death in the street with it. Um, so it's something I take seriously, but I've also got um, a lot of brothers <laughs> and a lot of friends who um, would back me up if it came to that. And I suppose, you know, uh, how can I put it? I'm used to fighting in lots of different ways and some things are worth fighting for. It's as simple as that, yeah. So I'd just like to add to that that as someone who loves your books, I would like you to stay alive and write more of them. Oh, yeah, I'm going to stay alive. It's not... Like, if that means not telling me where you're living, so <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I'm about to be killed, but it's... Uh, it's can't be. <laughs> well, I'm not immortal. <laughs> I have a, a slightly different question. That, that You've talked about the importance of political power. Uh, obviously, that's something. Um, but I wonder, maybe it's because I'm an old teacher and I come from a family of teachers and I believe in education so strongly. Mm -hmm. Do you think having a national curriculum that has one of its cross-curriculum themes of Indigenous Australia, has this made a difference in, in creating better understanding between the general community and Indigenous Australians? Has it improved anything? Has it changed anything? Could we do more of that? Yeah, I, I, um, I suppose for 20-odd years I've, since the Keating era... I've seen things slowly getting worse as far as racism towards Aboriginal people in Australia. And because of that, I have felt quite um, ambivalent or, or, you know, not that impressed with what education has achieved. But I've actually... I'll tell you a little story. Uh, where I live, I live next door to um, a truckie, or a bloke that drives a delivery truck. Uh, his name's Dave. And Dave's about... He must be pushing 60, I think. And he's a real Aussie bloke. He's... Um, he couldn't get more dinky-dye Aussie than Dave. And he's a nice fella. I don't know that he would have gone to grade 12 in his life. He gets up every morning at 5.30 and gets on his motorbike, drives off and does a 12-hour day, and then he comes home at about 6 at night, every weekday. Um, so he's just a pure working class, you know, very straight kind of a bloke. And he's a good guy. And he, he sang out to me the other day and said, were you on the radio the other morning? And I said, yeah, I was. And he'd been listening to the Aboriginal radio station in Brisbane, to my surprise. And then he started talking to me about <coughs> the book Warrior by Dr Libby Connors, which is the non-fiction story of Dunderley, the warrior who, who was a resistance fighter in Brisbane in the colonial era. And he couldn't shut up about it. He just... He's, he's driving his wife mad talking about it. She said he will not stop talking about this book. And Dave has read one book in his adult life, and it's that book. And when I heard that story, I thought, well, yeah, maybe education... Maybe the books we write aren't a waste of time after all. <laughs> so, yeah, I think a national curriculum is, is critically important. And it's like the, the Discrimination Act question. It's all important. We have to fight on every front, but we also have to keep aware that the, the jump between education in schools and legislation and the policies of different parties and what we allow on the media and what we see as vicious hate speech and regulate, the, the gap between that and people dying is not very big. That's the point I'm trying to get across. You know, It's not very far from Trump stirring up anti-Semitism and, and allowing it and a gunman walking into a synagogue in was it Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh and shooting 12 people dead, you know? We can't afford to be naive about these things. No. Any more questions? Yeah. I apologize, I haven't thought about how to phrase this yet, but just because we're talking about politics, we're talking about media, 
and some of the conversations come up on the street. Um, you being someone who's, who uh, interacts a lot with people with lots of heavy, heavily different, opinion, different opinions, do you have advice for regular Joe people like myself? When you come across someone with a really hateful opinion or a really hateful belief that they are perpetuating, yeah. Yeah. I don't have the temperament, the ability to talk to them. Do you have advice on how to engage with difference of opinions when you feel that, that difference of opinion has a real, a real serious impact on someone else? Um, I do. I was at a fundraiser event the other night, or the other week, for Sisters Inside, and I was on the panel with Debbie Kilroy, and we were talking, and Debbie was saying at a particular point in the organisation's life, there was an incident in the Brisbane Women's Prison where an infant died and didn't have to die, and was it was just horrible and graphic the way that the system in the prison treated the mother and... It, it, um, she actually was almost crying as she was telling the story. And this is someone who's done a lot of work in prison, very tough cookie, but she was almost in tears. And she said at that point she was further radicalised and started not believing anymore that the prisons could be reformed, that they had to be completely rebuilt from the ground up, the systems of justice that we have. And there was a fella in the front row who was the only bloke in the room in a suit and he, he was sort of stuck out like a sore, sore thumb from the beginning. And he started making comments like, oh, it happens all over the world. And, and like really callous, revolting comments. And I said to him, you, you need to be quiet, mate. And he kept going. And I actually got to my feet and I was ready to start thumping him. And I started swearing at him. And Debbie said, it's all right, I know him. He's just, you know, not particularly well. And so I sat back down again, but in the instant when I'd stood up, the young activists who were holding the fundraiser, very cluey young people, they'd swarmed him and got around him, formed a, a barrier, a physical barrier around him. So they didn't come to me, who was, you know, probably the perceived threat to him in that moment. They swarmed him. So if you're seeing someone um, being verbally racist in public, the first thing you do is you look around and say, who's being affected by it? Rather than focusing on them, is there a Muslim woman there who's feeling scared? And if there is, get yourself between him and her. You know, Is there a, a black kid who's about to go off and get arrested in response to what this guy's saying? Start talking to the black kid and, and telling him that you know, you're there with him. Um, I think is Julian Burnside gets a lot of death threat letters from people that are angry with what he does with refugees. And he writes back to them all, I believe. Writes back and tells them what he does and why he does it. And he says about 50% of them are so grateful to be heard that they change their attitudes. And that's a kind of a, a judgment call about whether someone is too, so far gone that you're wasting your breath or whether if you show them some compassion and, and listen to them in that moment, whether that's going to make a difference or not. Yeah. But, yeah, it's about seeing who's being affected in the immediate environment as much as the person doing the talking. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. My voice is just about how... All right. Well, I think we're, we're going to call that a night, and we're going to thank Melissa uh, very much for tonight. things you could do if you haven't already. Join, join Penn. It's a great idea. Um, it means that you will support our organisation. Donate to Penn if for some reason you don't think you want to be a member or if you want to do both. Uh, that helps us to continue to run events like this. Um, sign cards with us. Is it upstairs or downstairs? I'm so... Not with it. Upstairs in the cafe. We'll have biographies on pieces of paper of the writers we're writing to and some very brief messages for samples for people who want to write. We get messages back very occasionally from the writers we write to saying, 
It's so important to us to know that there are people across the world thinking about us. You humanise us in a way where prisoners and systems try to dehumanise us and tell us we are totally worthless and not remembered. So it's actually a very important um, activity. And thank you again, Melissa, and thank you to all of you for coming today. Our next public event will be with the Sydney Writers' Festival and it will be the Pen Free Voices Lecture. Thank you very much.